Hey, uh, you know, Soren Kierkegaard lived in the last century, and, he, and he, we talked about him a little while ago, and he told this parable that I think is kind of like the secret fantasy of every kid born before the invention of the barcode and the computer scanner. Um, back in the olden days, and it looks like most of us in this room know what the olden days were, they had these things called price tags, that, and, that, and they were often just like a little printed thing on a sticky piece of paper that would be put on items in the grocery store at like Kmart or, or whatever. And they were remark really remarkably easy to switch. So how many of you ever had this fantasy where you're with mom at the grocery store, she's complaining about how much food is, and you're, I'm like seven year olds, go just switch the price tags. Well, in Soren Kierkegaard, did any of you have that? Did you ever think that? I'm the only one. Okay, well, you could pray for me. But anyway, in Soren Kierkegaard's parable, he tells this parable um, about these two robbers that break into a jewelry store, and instead of stealing the jewels, they do something far worse. They switch all the price tags, such that the cheap costume jewelry, you know, with imitation jewels and gold paint, is then valued most highly, and then the real thing, the diamonds and solid gold, is valued as plastic and, and paint. No one notices at first, but of course, over the years, people can begin to realize that they'd spent a, a fortune for trash or that they had stumbled upon absolute treasure. And Kierkegaard would then argue that that is the condition of our age. Someone has uh, switched the price tags, or maybe no one knew the difference between valuable and worthless, good and evil, in the first place. I so clearly uh, remember walking by a row of yachts moored in a marina in Cannes, France, years ago. On the French Riviera, each yacht must have easily been valued at several million dollars. And on the back of one of these yachts sat these two elderly couples, so four people, at a folding card table in uh, folding chairs, uh, playing cards and just laughing. And I thought, yacht, $10 million. Deck of cards, 99 cents. Friends to laugh with, priceless and absolutely free. Someone switched the price tags. So you could spend your entire life chasing a yacht and find yourself utterly miserable or you could buy a pack of cards this afternoon and learn how to laugh with your neighbor. Jesus said something about that. Treasure up treasure in heaven. Peter told us that the heavens and the earth are treasured up for fire. Remember, we've been reading that. Being kept until the day of judgment when the works that are done on the earth will be found out. So the fire will fall on the yacht one day, and I suspect the yacht will just disappear. But something else will remain. And the fire will fall upon this building. And I suspect the building will just, like, disappear. And yet something else will remain, perhaps even shaped like this building, you know, but made out of something else entirely. Peter tells us that one day in a new heaven and new earth, righteousness will dwell. You know, like a man at home in, in his house. Paul tells us repeatedly that one day Christ will be all in all. And God will be all in all. Or already is all in all and we like just can't see it. All in all and he's imperishable. He is eternal. So this entire universe is like an empty vessel that is being filled. And what we think is empty is actually full, and what we think is full may actually be empty for someone switched the price tags, and or we never knew what was valuable and worthless, good and evil in the first place. Even physicists now say the very same thing. So space and time are something of an illusion, and matter doesn't really matter, but something in you does. 
And, and not only is the universe like a vessel that is being filled, you are also like a vessel that is at least part empty and longing to, to be filled. We spoke about this last time. You are like one of these glass vessels, these variously shaped earthen vessels. Each one is, you know, part full and part empty. You can think of the water in the glass or the water here in the jar. You can, the water, um, you can think of the water as uh, righteousness. And Scripture says that uh, Jesus is our righteousness. So the water is eternal. Uh, it is who I am, which is what I cannot do, but God has done. Because I can't create myself. The empty space is who I think I should be and cannot make myself become. It is who I am not, and yet who it is that I may have convinced myself that I am. It is the self I think I have created or should create. It's the false self, that empty part. The jar is my psyche in Greek, translated soul and sometimes life. So the water is my zoe. That's always translated life. And, and scripture says Jesus had an imperishable zoe. And the emptiness is a nothing that we think is something, you could call it sin. A nothing that we think is a something because someone switched the price tags. Okay, 2 Peter 3 verse 7, what we've been reading, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up, thesarizo, treasured up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. If the ungodly are filled with God, well, I guess they'd be destroyed, right? Destroyed and judged and made new, something else entirely. The day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is just one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. That's the promise of his parousia. That's what Peter's been talking about. Not slow to fulfill his promise, the promise of his parousia, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing that any be lost, be perished, but that all literally repent to make room. As if you were a house, repent to make room. That is, realize that what you think is full is actually empty. Repent to make room, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the stoichion, the elements, will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, literally will be found. So the Lord and his day will come like a thief. But as we preached, he's not a thief. He's your husband. But if you didn't know that he was your husband, well, you might hide from him, right? Hoping to not be found as if he were a thief. But he can't be a thief. He owns everything, and he's your husband. But if you, if you, if you recognized his voice, and, and you had felt rather lost and alone, you'd be simply overjoyed at what? At being found in his presence. Peter has referred to this idea with the Greek word parousia. Scholars and some religious folks, like those in the church that which Peter was writing to, they love to fuss over what they call the delay of the parousia. In Matthew 24, Jesus said this, This generation will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Right? That seems to create a problem this generation. But, but we seem to utterly ignore the fact that in Matthew 26, Jesus said to the high priest at his trial, listen closely, I tell you, I tell you all, I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So if you believe Jesus, from then on, the high priest did see 
Jesus in power and glory, even though he told himself all that he saw was a despised carpenter from Nazareth standing before him, you know, looking like a slaughtered lamb on Passover. You get the picture? It's like someone switched all the price tags. One day the high priest in all flesh will see and won't be able to deny the power and the glory. But if we believe Jesus... Well, he has been coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory ever since that, that moment, ever since that day. So the high priest saw but didn't see, but Peter did see. For just as Jesus uttered those words, a cock crowed. And Jesus looked at Peter, and Peter was judged and destroyed. And then became who he always was. The rock. Karl Barth, arguably the best exegete of the 20th century, he defined parousia. He said it means effective presence. Like a presence that you're paying attention to. It's effective. Manifest. In his commentary on Romans, he writes this. Will there, ever, will there never be an end of all of our ceaseless talk about the delay of the parousia? How can the coming of that which doth not enter in ever be delayed. The end of which the New Testament speaks is no temporal event. What delays its coming is not the parousia, but our awakening. He claims that this awakening happened for Mary and Peter on Easter. And, and you know, he only, well, you've read the Bible, he only shows up to the people that were waiting for him, or hoping for him. They didn't know what to expect. And, and then he says, Karl Barth says, it also happens for each one of us through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and it will happen for all at the end of the age. It's the presence of the age to come, the day when it is finished and everything is good. Peter calls it the day of God. The day invaded these days, the day that Jesus spoke those words to the high priest, looked at Peter, and then at the end of the day cried out, Father, forgive, it is finished, and into your hands I commit my spirit while hanging on a tree in the middle of a garden. So do you see the power? And the glory? Can you see how just the revelation of that day destroys everything not good? With the very presence of the good? And how it destroys all that we think we have accomplished with the revelation that it was all accomplished, it was all finished at that tree? Jürgen Moltmann used to point out that the day of the Lord inspired fear in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it inspires hope because the authors had come to know and trust the Lord whose day it is. 2 Peter 3, 10. Peter writes, the day of the Lord will come. It will. Like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar or a swoosh, and the elements will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be found. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people, or literally from what tribe of people, ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the parousia, the coming, the effective presence of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the elements will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. You know, like a man at home in his own house. So verse 11, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? And we say, at last, at last. Now we're cutting to the chase, Peter. Enough highfalutin, bizarre theology. Now we're getting down to the application. Describe the person that I'm supposed to be. Okay. There it is. Be this sort of person. Here, here's a list and uh, actually, there's three lists up there. The list on the left, it comes from Peter. 
the, the, lift, the list in the middle, the lisp, the list in the middle comes from Paul, and the list on the right comes from, from God uh, through, through Moses written in stone. Second Peter, you know, is a short letter. We uh, read chapter one several weeks ago, so let me remind you of what we read by reading a portion uh, again, okay? Second Peter 1, 4. God has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers or communicants of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of desire. For the, and, and not all desires are wrong, so he's talking about a particular type of desire. For this very reason, and now comes a sentence that translators really struggle with and which we exegeted a few weeks ago, for, for this reason, and then it, it reads, make every effort to supplement Epikoregesate, so we get our word choreograph, epikorgeo. So more literally translated, it would read like this. Having contributed all diligence, choreograph the faith of you with the virtue, the good or the excellent, and the virtue with the knowledge, and the knowledge with the self-control, that is the control of self, and the control of self with the steadfastness, and the steadfastness with the godliness, that's reverence or worship, and the godliness with the brotherly affection, that's genuinely liking people, Philadelphia, and the brotherly affection with the love. In Greek, the definite article the doesn't operate just like it does in English, but it's still a definite article, meaning that we're talking about one love, and apparently all of these things are one thing. So Peter refers to it as divine nature, theos physis. The Orthodox Church refers to the process of these things growing in you from the promised and imperishable seed as theosis. Theo is the word for God. So uh, that's often translated into English as divinization. Not to be confused with divination, which is using the divine to exalt yourself. Divinization is becoming divine through the sacrifice of self. So anyway, there you have it. Be uh, these things. But Peter actually said something like ex choreo dance and sing these things such that, you know, your right hand doesn't even know what your left hand is doing. But how are you going to do that? That's Peter's list on the left, and it reminds me of Paul's list in the middle. Peter's list is summed up with love, and Paul's list begins with love, and then joy, and then peace, and patience, and kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and control of self. Paul calls these things the fruit of the Holy Spirit as opposed to the works of the flesh. And you remember we talked about the flesh and the problem with the flesh. The flesh literally eats life. That's what food is. The flesh eats life and poops death. And uh, there's another problem with the flesh, and that is it's a prison unto itself. For this body of flesh only suffers its own pain and only feels its own pleasures. It's incredibly self-centered. Peter and Paul's list reminds me of God's lists given to Moses. Moses, Paul, and Peter, in line with Jesus, say that the entire list, that list on the right, can be summed up with one word, and the word is love. Love is the desire to do this list because you want to do this list and nothing but this list, the do's and don'ts of God. Number one, do worship God. Don't worship anything else. Number two, be the image. Don't make images, graven images. Number three, don't do serve in God's name. Don't use God's name to serve yourself. In other words, don't use the name in vain for your own ego. Number four, keep the day of rest. That is, work at not working. Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, don't take life. Do give life. Number seven, don't sleep around. Do be faithful. Number eight, don't take what isn't yours. Number nine, don't lie. Number ten, don't even desire your neighbor's wife or any of his or her stuff. America. I added that last word. It's interesting that Louisiana just passed a, a law stating that 
This list must clearly be displayed in readable font on the walls in classrooms of elementary schools in Louisiana. And I must say that the history of Western civilization is impossible to teach without referring to this list. And yet, it's really weird to post it on the wall of an elementary school classroom without some sort of explanation or story around it. You know, when Moses first brought this list down the mountain, it had already been broken by the people. And then Moses literally broke the list, shattered it, the stone, the stone Ten Commandments. The punishment for breaking the commandments is, class, death. It's death. And so the folks who took this knowledge of good and evil were dead and dying already. In fact, when Moses went back up on the mountain and got a second copy, if you remember, God had Moses place the list in Aron, in an Aron. You, you know what that is? The first place is comp, translated in the Bible is translated coffin. That's in Genesis. He had him place it in a coffin, which then in Exodus gets translated as ark, same thing. And then God gave Moses pages and pages of elaborate instructions about how the Israelites were to relate to that coffin in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle that became the temple and how the high priest, you know, was to sprinkle the blood of sacrifice on top of the ark where the presence, the parousia of the living of God would appear and then issue judgment. And, and now we know that a slaughtered lamb stands on that throne. That's an amazing story. But you see, the law then must be encased in the story. The desire and ability to fulfill the law is love. The law is the description of love. But love is not a law that we can simply take and just, you know, apply to ourselves. Love's the one standing on the throne on top of the coffin. If the Israelites took the lid off of the coffin... Do you remember what happened? If the Israelites took the lid off of the ark and looked inside, they would die. Their face would melt off. Their face would melt off. You saw it in the movie. And that comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16 where it like actually happened. So you see, it's just a little weird to post the law on the wall of a third grade classroom without an explanation, a story called the gospel. Kurt Vonnegut, the science fiction writer, once commented about how strange it was that Christians would want to post the Ten Commandments in public places and courtrooms, but he had never ever heard of any Christian arguing that should, we should like uh, on the wall post the Beatitudes. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. In a courtroom? In the Sermon on the Mount, which we preached a few years ago, Jesus elaborates on the Ten Commandments. And by the end of this sermon, if you are anything but poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungry, and thirsty for righteousness, you did not listen to what he said. And yet, you know, he started that sermon with those Beatitudes. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, the hungry and thirsty for righteousness. All of these lists are describing righteousness. And Peter just told us that the elements will be dissolved with fire and all things will be filled with righteousness, which is the divine nature, the fruit of the Spirit, the love in flesh, which fulfills the law. And then Peter asks, what sort, what tribe of people ought you to be in, in light of all this that we just learned in Second Peter? Answer, duh, righteous people. That's the kind of people we ought to be. So most folks think the pastor's job is to describe righteousness in such a way that, you know, they could take this knowledge of good and evil, apply it to their lives, and make themselves righteous. In other words, self-righteous. And just so you know, I should describe righteousness. For just as Peter told us, I will continue to remind you of these. 
his descriptions of the divine nature. It's important to describe right. Every sermon I preach should be a description of righteousness. But you see, there's an application problem, isn't there? Why? Well, because that's righteousness. Or I should say, to use Paul's words, he is our righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30, God has made him to be our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our holiness, and our redemption. So, so Adam, humanity, how do you apply him to your life? Imagine if I overheard one of my children talking to another one of my children then, when they were little. <laughs> and, and they said, you know, when I want to grow up, I want to be just like daddy. Oh, man, nothing would please me more. But imagine if I ever heard one of my children talking to another one of my children saying, when, I'm going, don't, when, I, when I grow up, I'm going to be dad. And so I'm learning all about dad so I can take his place and I won't need dad. That would make me just incredibly sad. Imagine if on my honeymoon night, my, my bride said to me, now I'm going to apply you to me, baby. I'm going to make you my own body. I'm going to kill you and consume you like a chicken sandwich. Well, if I thought she really meant that, that would make me sad. Or imagine if on my honeymoon night she said to me, now I'm going to make my body just like your body. I'm going to dissect you, study you, and surgically transform my body into your body. Well, that would also make me sad. It would make me sad, and I would suggest a better way that two bodies might become one flesh. Imagine if you stood in front of this tree and you saw that the fruit was good for food and a delight to the eyes, and so, you know, you just took it and you ate it. Or imagine if you stood in front of the tree and you saw that, well, he was desired. He, he was to be desired to make one wise, and so you took knowledge from the tree to make yourself him. Wisdom. Or imagine if you paid somebody to reduce that knowledge to a list that you could pretend to do so that you could justify yourself to the man on the tree when he appeared on top of the ark between the cherubim. That might make him sad. You getting my point? There's an application problem. And perhaps Peter is suggesting a, a better way. Now, Adam, humanity, how do you apply him to your life? Or is he applying you to his life? The life with the article. Are you making him your body or is he making you his body? Are you using him to build your house or are you the house that is being built by him? Now some people hear this and they say to me, So are you saying that I shouldn't even try? And to that I say, well, no. Of course you should try. If an alcoholic came to me and said, should I even try to stop drinking? I'd say, yes, absolutely. With every ounce of energy you've got, you try to stop drinking. But if they then said to me, do you think I will stop drinking? I'd say, no, I think you're powerless to stop drinking. But until you try to stop drinking, you will not appeal to a power greater than yourself. And so I'm going to remind you of sober living over and over and over again until you repent and go to a, an AA meeting. And so I must remind us of righteousness until we repent and continually do what Peter now tells us to do. Back to our text, verse, verse 3, 11, uh, or this is along about verse uh, 14. Uh, the next verse, okay, 14, the next verse is Peter's application point. I think it's the very same point that we found in Romans, along about chapter 12. 
and in all of Paul's letters to all the churches. Okay, ready? 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be, gil- be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord, this is how you think about it, salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant or the unlearned uh, and unstable, they twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace of Jesus is a subjective genitive. We know that because it obviously means that it's not our grace for Jesus, it's Jesus' grace for us. And so knowledge of Jesus, which is in parallel, is also a subjective genitive, meaning that we're not talking about our knowledge of Jesus, We're talking about being known by Jesus. And if you know anything about biology, you also know that that is where fruit comes from. Which brings us back to the practical application point. Did you catch it? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, because of all this stuff we've learned in 2 Peter, therefore, beloved, you need to know that you're beloved. Okay, that's not an option. You just need to know that. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, these are all things filled with righteousness, which we're all waiting for, righteousness which is the divine nature, all things and yourself filled with righteousness, which is Jesus And if you are waiting for these, right, it means that you do not fully have these. In other words, you're like this. You've got some, but you're but you're not full full if if you're waiting. And waiting means waiting means, I don't know if you knew this, but it means that you are actively doing what? Nothing. That's what waiting is. Junior high, I used to always wait for my mom after my paper route. And I wanted to go home and watch Star Trek, but she wanted to do something else. I don't know what it was, but she wasn't picking me up. It means that you cannot do your will because you're waiting upon another will. Since you are waiting for righteousness, be diligent. Spudazzo, also translated strive. As in Hebrews 4.11, strive to enter his rest, which means strive to enter the holy of holies, which is the effective presence of the day of the Lord, the seventh day, uh, when there will be no striving. So strive to enter not striving. Since you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, strive to be found. It's the same verb that he used a little while ago when he said the works that are done on earth will be found, they're going to be exposed by the fire. Be diligent to be found. So what does that look like? In September of 1977, a miracle happened. Mrs. Uh, Re- Reidberg, re- I'm crying, this is so silly. Mrs. Reidberg read the seating chart in Masterpieces of American Literature, Heritage High School, and I discovered that I was seated next to this gorgeous angel, Susan Coleman. And although I absolutely hated English, I was never, ever late to masterpieces of American literature. And I always lingered, striving to be found. And yet at the same time, I was terrified to be found. For what if she didn't like what she found? And so I pretended to be someone I was not. And therefore, I was really rather hard for her to find. Years later, I discovered that she had also wanted to be found, but she was terrified of being found, and so she presented a self that was actually quite confusing to me and made it rather hard for me to find her. So, praise God for the seating chart. It's a little like the law, but praise God for the seating chart. We had to sit there. You see, it kind of forced us to be found, and what I began to find, the true Susan, 
insecure, lonely, vulnerable, passionate, and real. Hidden under the false Susan, confident, connected, self-assured, unflappable, and fake, the real Susan was so much more attractive to me than the fake. And for some reason, I had always suspected that the very thing she was hiding under those fig leaves, well, that might be most attractive of all. Five and a half years later, we entered a covenant. I uncovered her. And then I covered her with myself. And I filled her with myself. And she gave birth to myself. My very own flesh and blood. And they are more than a house. They're my home. Go figure. C.S. Lewis used to tell people that his last novel, Till We Have Faces, which I think could also be titled Till We Become Who We Are. Anyway, he said it was his best novel and his favorite of all the books that he'd ever written. It's a complicated story and a retelling of the myth of Psyche and Eros, which in Latin is Cupid. He's the son of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Psyche is Greek for soul. You must lose your psyche to find it, said Jesus. Well, in the story, Psyche is told that she must be sacrificed to the God to save the people of Gloam, which is her father's kingdom. She resigns herself to this fate, absolutely infuriating her sister, to whom she says at one point, if I am to go to the God, of course it must be through death. That way, even what is strangest in the holy sayings might be true. To be eaten and to be married to the God might not be so different. We don't understand. And that's true. We American Christians, in particular, do not understand the biblical notion of sacrifice. To, to offer your life to the one who gives life might not only be death, but the death of death which is eternal life. Well, Psyche in, in the story is sacrificed. And eventually, at the end of the book, we discover that she has become a goddess. And in the end, her sister presents herself to be found at the temple of the god, by the god, like her sister Psyche, and the god reveals that she is also Psyche. They are one Psyche. Psyche. And if you take Scripture literally, if you take it seriously, you will realize that we are all a part of the psyche of God. Even if you have imagined yourself to be something else. So listen to the application, 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at at, at, at peace, at, at peace. Perhaps that's how we hasten his parousia, his fiery presence. We trust him. We pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We preach his kingdom will come on earth as it is in, in heaven. His kingdom will come, his will, his will, which is his word, it will be done, and, and he's good. <laughs> that's called the gospel. But do you understand, without spot or blemish is the language of what? If you ever read Leviticus, you know this. It's the language of sacrifice. 1 Peter 1.18, Peter wrote, You were ransomed from your futile ways, the futile ways inherited from your fathers by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That, that lamb is Jesus. God never hated the sacrifices. And without blemish or spot means that you offer your best. Jesus is your best. He's the best. He is the righteousness imprisoned in your self-righteous ego. And, and so what's the blemish or the spot? Well, I suspect it is your ego. Jesus is the very righteousness that confesses it to God. He is your faith, hope, and love, the decision to love. We wash our filthy garments in the blood of the... That's what all those songs and stuff are about. In Ephesians 5, Paul writes this. Listen closely. Husbands, love your wives. I said this at your 
service, remember? Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might make her holy, having cleansed her with the word. It's kind of freaky because the word's like a knife, like a burning, flaming knife. That he might present her to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing without blemish. Now that used to sound so strange and, you know, I don't know, inappropriate to me until I realized what it meant. That just as he sacrificed himself to us, he now causes us, he romances us to sacrifice ourselves to him. And this is anything but death. It's actually the very definition of life. I don't have time to explain this, but life is a communion of sacrificial love. It's righteousness. 2 Peter 3, 4. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for righteousness, be diligent to be found by righteousness, spotless and without blemish, and at peace. Don't worry. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, brothers, present your bodies a sacrifice, living, sanctified, acceptable to God, your logical service, the thing that you're, that you're called to do. You know, it's something that we can do every moment. And yet I try to set aside uh, some time to do it. Most mornings, I'll just sit in silence. I used to set a timer for 20 minutes, but anymore, I, I can't seem to stop, and sometimes I'll go on even for, for a few hours. I strive to be found. I simply become aware of his presence, the parousia. Sometimes I picture myself sitting on the lap of God in Jesus from the bosom of the Father. Sometimes I think of myself sitting next to Jesus on a beach. Just, I know he's just right there. Sometimes I read scripture and, and it's weird, but I can't stop because I begin to see him. I see righteousness. And yet in his presence, I become aware of unrighteousness. My nature and the divine nature, the work of my flesh and the fruit of his spirit, aware that I have broken the law over and over, and he fulfills the law. But like the wheat and the tares, the grain and the chaff, the good and the evil, you see, I can't judge it. I sit there, but I can't sort it all out. I know it's there, but I'm like, God, I don't know if I was loving at that point or not. I don't know exactly what to do. I can't sort it out, and I can't make myself righteous. But I begin to pray in the presence. Usually something like this. Yep. Here I am. <laughs> Here I am, poor in spirit. Here I am, mourning, and just feeling so insanely meek. Here I am, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, because I just don't feel very righteous, Jesus. In fact, sometimes I seriously think you've got the wrong guy. Here I am, Merciful, because who am I to condemn anybody else? So, so here am I, here I am. Well, I guess pure in heart, because I really only want one thing, and, and that's you. Here I am making peace, a peacemaker. People don't like that. Here I am persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Here I am blessed and rejoicing, for so they persecuted the prophets before me. And at this point, I'm not sure who it is that's praying. <laughs> righteousness or me? To make myself God is original sin. But if Jesus makes me himself somehow, oh, that is something else entirely. I cannot build him a house, but I'm the house that he's building. 
And we, the sanctuary, also the house that he's building, we're his home. A few weeks ago, my friend Didi, who's our business manager, she sent you all a letter regarding finances and explaining that giving has dropped rather dramatically since April. I think attendance in person probably has it all as well, even, even if it may have increased online. I know some reasons for this. There are reasons that I don't think I can fix, and I'm sure there are many that I don't understand. In a pinch last year, you know, I, I wrote you all a letter, and for a time, giving shot way up. But, but I don't think I should just be writing letters like that every month, all the time. In June, uh, many of you uh, responded. You have responded. This is the 30th. You responded to Didi's letter, but and, and that was great. That We broke even in June, but, but I think we still, it seems we still need to ask some hard questions about pay cuts and, and at least consider selling the building. But the sanctuary is not the building. The sanctuary is like the faith, hope, and love in those old people playing cards on the back deck of that yacht in France. It's imperishable. But needless to say, it's made me feel rather poor in spirit, mournful, meek, and frankly ashamed. I mean, I find it hard to sleep. Three weeks ago, at the end of the message, Susan grabbed me, and I know this is weird, but it happens to her, and I've learned to trust it. She came up front, and she, she grabbed me, and, and she said, Peter, I saw you stand on the edge of a high cliff, and you were so hungry, and Satan walked up to you. Later, I asked her, how did you know it was Satan? She said, I can tell by his eyes, but anyway, I think she can tell. She said, he walked up to you holding a loaf of bread. And you refused the bread. I mean, Jesus in you refused the bread. And I said, what's the bread? And she said, I don't know. I don't know what the bread is. Last week, I decided to spend a day hungry and praying. And in the afternoon, I climbed a mountain asking, God, what's the bread? And a a phrase kept running through my mind, eating the bread of anxious toil. When I got home, I looked it up because it sounded vaguely familiar. And it was Psalm 127, which I preached a sermon on a few years ago, goes like this. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. I shared that with Susan. She said, yeah. She said, yeah, you know, um, when Satan offered you the bread, I heard Jesus inside of you saying, if you eat this bread, you will always be hungry. Always hungry and never satisfied. Just the opposite of always thirsty and yet always being filled and always full, like we talked about last week, if a river of life is flowing through you. You know, I used to be considered a very successful pastor by worldly standards, but I think I was always anxious, hungry, and never satisfied. Then Susan said this to me because she was working in the garden. She said, hey, is there a Revelation 22? She really doesn't know this stuff. And And I said, yeah, it's in the Bible. It's the last book of the Bible. And she said, well, I heard Revelation 22 and something about a tree. We read it. It's John's description of the New Jerusalem coming down, adorned as a bride for her husband, and the river of the water of life that flows from the throne throughout the city, and the tree of life on either sides of that river, whose leaves are for the healing of of the nations. It's the sanctuary of God. It's his house. It's his temple. It's his home. So I am so grateful for the sanctuary that is us, because I can preach about the end that is now and the tree of life that grows in the garden sanctuary of our soul, but I don't want to eat any of Satan's goddamned bread. And I don't want you to eat it either. We cannot build the sanctuary. But we are the sanctuary that is being built 
and is built through us when we are diligent to be found, spotless and without blemish, and at peace. We can do that all the time. It's called worship. It's like dancing to a tune that the world doesn't hear. We can do that individually and alone, and some call it contemplation, like at uh, sacred space or, or, or prayer. We, we can do that together in small groups, and they should, they should all somehow look like AA meetings. In other words, you should introduce yourself as, my name is Peter, and I am unrighteous. <laughs> and together, surrender yourself to a righteousness greater than yourself. And that is what we do every time we come to this table. And this is what I'm asking you to do. Strive to be found. Whether you come downtown or you connect online, whether you live in this country or live in another country, would you make yourself the offering? See, I honestly do not know how we're supposed to look. As I said in the letter last year, I think we're called to be a community that gathers to worship in person and a community without physical walls and yet connected online, both in Colorado and around the world. I'd like to keep this building because we bought it for 900,000 bucks 10 years ago. And in Denver, I don't think we could buy anything cheaper. It's weird, but that's... The... Anyway, renting space once a week, I think, is a challenge for broadcasting. And I do like a place that feels like home for, for us and for others that might come here for things like the conference that we want to be a part of in 2025, but maybe we have that somewhere else. But you see, I, I, don't, want us to keep, I don't want us to keep the building if God desires something else. And we're done with what he's asked us to do uh, in this place. And so I'm not asking you to give more money. I'm calling you in Jesus' name to do this. Present yourself a sacrifice. Why? Because you are God's building material. I don't know exactly what you or I am. I mean, you may be a two-by-four, you may be a piece of plywood, you may be a loose screw, but you are his building material. And so I'm saying present yourself to the carpenter. And, and when you do this, God will have done this in you. Why? Because he's the righteousness. He's the decision uh, to do this, the decision to love. And, and when you do this, when you pour yourself into God, God will do this. And then you will genuinely want to do this. And they will want to do this, and, and you will do this, and it will just keep happening like this, and that's eternal life now. Whether you're sitting on the back of a yacht in France or playing cards in the garage in Cleveland. So this might look like giving more money to the sanctuary Denver, if that's what God's asking you to do. It might look like giving less money here. Actually, none of our money belongs to us, so even that is... Anyway, it may be that, if that's what God leads you to do. It might look like miraculous gifts flowing out of your soul to everyone uh, in, in this room and around the world. It might look like a journey through the desert with a friend. I don't know what it will look like, and I don't know what God will lead you to do, but whatever it is, it will be right. And we will be righteous, for in this, I'm making a mess up here, in, in this is love. And why would we do this? Well, because first, he did this. On the night he was betrayed by all of us, 
He took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, and having given thanks, he said, this is the blood of the covenant. I wanted to get this right. And you can read this in several different gospels. He says, this is the blood of the covenant. And then he used technical terms that Paul also used, that Peter uses, which is poured out for you, poured out for many, he said for the forgiveness of sins. Remember, Peter started with the reason we get caught up in all this stuff, we've forgotten we were cleansed of our, of our sins. Poured for, for, for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said, drink it. All of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So are you stressed about uh, the church? Good. <laughs> It's just about your house. Maybe your arthritis or the fact that you're getting older. And you went to the dermatologist and they made a hole in your nose when you were trying to get, make sure that didn't happen. It's stuff like that. Are you stressed about that? Do not eat the bread of anxious toil. And do not stress about this church. Instead, be diligent to be found. I honestly don't know what we're supposed to look like. I mean, I seriously think we might be in this building for decades more and it might fill up. We might be something else. I'm, I don't think God is done with us yet. So, so I don't know. But, but this is maybe important to remember. Soon after Peter wrote Second Peter, and we'll finish it next week, he was poured out. Paul even wrote to Timothy saying, I'm about to be poured out. And, and no, it was to, or to the Philippians. And then to Timothy he said, I am already being poured out. It's, it's this word that, that the Bible uses a lot. Jesus found Peter, you know, as he was uh, fleeing Rome. And together they went back into the city. And, and when Peter died, just as when Jesus died, there were no nonprofit organizations, <laughs> there was no building. There uh, were no fancy hats. There was no Vatican. And remember, supposedly, he's, they call him the first pope. All that there was was an offering, a sacrifice of love. Rome has long since turned to dust. The Vatican, the fancy hats, this building will all soon turn to dust. But the offering will remain the love in you that is you is that offering, and he who loves is born of God, and God is imperishable. So Peter's not dead. He just began to live. And this is wild, but it turns out that Peter really is a rock. He is one of the 12 foundation stones upon which Jesus built his house, or I should say our house, not just a house, our home. You, me, Peter, and Jesus our home. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.